Hello, and welcome to Trusting After Trauma Season 3, Transitioning to Transformation After Narcissistic Abuse. I'm your host, Pi Venus Winslow. Our focus this season is on making powerful decisions to create transformational life changes for those who have experienced childhood trauma and narcissistic abuse so they can reclaim their happiness and personal power. Our speakers specialize in supporting others through their unique expertise and offer valuable insights, tools, and inspiration for viewers to find the courage and motivation to change their lives. I'm so excited to have Darylise Lyons here with us today. Darylise Lyons is a journalist, an actor, and an activist. She has written more than two dozen full-length books, a handful of short stories, and countless articles performed in various plays and improv comedy shows. She is a member of the National Association of Black Journalists, NABJ, and a summa cum laude graduate of NYU with a double major in English and Religious Studies and a minor in History. After writing an award-winning children's book called I'm Mixed about embracing her multi-ethnic heritage, Darylise found her passion and her purpose educating others about the need to embrace all aspects of themselves. She then went on to create the Demystifying Diversity podcast and to write the book, Demystifying Diversity, Embracing Our Shared Humanity. She works tirelessly as a full-time DEI expert and inclusivity strategist. Welcome, Darylise. I'm so happy you've joined us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Pai, for having me. And I'm really glad to be here with you and with all the viewers. Yeah, yeah. So can you speak about your trauma history? Oh, gosh, yes. Um, so I want to say that I am in recovery from an eating disorder. Um, and so there were many, many years that I was very traumatically abusive to myself and my own body and my own person. Um, and beyond that, I have a history of sexual abuse when I was a child, um, verbal and, and emotional abuse uh, from a former step parent and um, sexual abuse within a relationship um, as a teen and into my 20s. So I certainly have, you know, come from uh, experiences that were were hard and and painful and yet I can say today you know sitting here with you now that I would not undo my past if I could because I believe that it's a huge part of what I have to offer the world and my ability to be empathetic towards others and um, and it's what I needed in order to find self-love and and really um, you know freedom but I had to go through a lot of really, really painful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I know a lot. I mean, I can relate to that and I'm sure a lot of other people, you know, can relate to that, that, you know, our experiences, um, you know, when, when they are very painful, um, those experiences also help shape our character and make us who we are. So, I mean, you know, not to minimalize what happened, but, shifting the perspective towards seeing, you know, the gifts or the lessons that, um, that come from those experiences. Yeah. And I think, you know, that shift in perspective is not something that can happen too early in the process. I think sometimes when people try to go from grief to gratitude, you know, in a, in a minute, it, it doesn't work. It's like a spiritual and emotional bypass. And then you're just left feeling horrible, but not knowing why you feel horrible and all that stuff. And so I really, you know, um, I'm somewhat known in the industry as the transformational storyteller because I believe that the stories we tell ourselves and others shape the lives that we live. And so, you know, I find there's this gradual process of evolutionary storytelling where um, when I was in the midst of my pain, in the midst of those traumatic moments, um, you know, my story about them would have been very, very different. And even, you know, eight years ago, my story would have been very different and two years ago and one year. And so, you know, it's, it's this constant process. And I think it requires, you know, to get that perspective, 
really requires for people to kind of like move through those painful experiences and and continue to um, to do what it takes, right? To um, to evolve past that and to kind of like not let your story, your present story, your future story be defined by your past experiences, but also to know that those past experiences are very important. And unless they're dealt with and reconciled in some way, I think, you know, we will spend our lifetime sort of repeating patterns of, of trauma, feeling stuck in certain ways, feeling ashamed, like it's shrinking from the world. And so, yeah, it's this, it's this weird dance and symbiosis, I think, um, between the past and the present and wanting to move forward and also knowing that, um, like, we can't, you know, what happened happened and, um, and it continues to inform many things, right? And, and so, like, yeah, it's important to honor it and honor ourselves while also trying our best not to stay stuck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how has DEI work supported your healing? Yeah, well, that's such a great question. Um, so I want to first define what DEI is, as it stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, you know, what does that mean, right? So diversity is sort of all of the things that make us who we are, all of these intersecting factors of identity and experience. You know, I think this world is a very diverse place. There's people who look like me, people who don't look like me, people who have similar life histories, people who don't. Um, and so, um, so diversity, being exposed to people from all different stratospheres of society has given me a deeper sense of, of human resilience and, and an understanding of, um, of my own experiences through the experiences of other human beings that I've sat with as a journalist and um, and a diversity, equity, and inclusion expert, and really gotten to see like, oh, well, what, you know, what brings us together as humans? You know, what is that? What is it? What is that spark? What is that spirit? What is that light, right, that, that animates us? And, and, and if that light is in you, well, then it also must be in me. And so the, the diversity piece has a lot to do with that. Um, equity, which is really about supporting people at the level that they are and equipping them for success, uh, you know, and, and understanding that people have different needs and, and different requirements and really trying to like honor where someone is. I think that's very, very helpful for trauma work, actually, like, right, like it's discovering, well, where is someone and what kind of scaffolding do you require in order to uh, live the life that you want, you know, and meet your goals and metrics and sort of be a member of, of society in a way that feels um, good to you and self-honoring and also where you're, you're of contribution. And so, you know, that equity work, I think is, is incredibly important to trauma work and then inclusion. I mean, you know, like one of the, one of the worst things about trauma uh, for me, I, I mean, I can't speak to anyone else's experience, but for me, one of the worst things was feeling lack of safety and feeling like, um, there were parts of me that I could not share with others. There were parts of me that I could not, um, that, that like had to be hidden, right? And feeling a sense of aloneness. And I think that's something that a lot of people with trauma histories feel like I'm the only one and that sense of shame. And, and so inclusion, you know, inclusion is essential and a sense of belonging and a, and a sense of community and people that you can be yourself with and share your story that, you know, know the things about you that you think are unlovable, know the things about me that I think are unlovable and those people love me and they honor me, you know, there's so much healing in that. So I think diversity, equity, and inclusion is really part of the experience of like engaging with the world in a meaningful way, in a way that allows me to be all of myself and, and create space for others to be all of themselves. I, I think that it's, it's incredibly healing and I wish more people looked at DEI that way because I think if more people did, more would get on board <laughs> with, you know, with, it, with, it, with that sort of active engagement and that deep curiosity about themselves and others. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so like playing off of that, like how, how does it support other people? Yeah, that is such a great question. Um, so how does diversity work support other people specifically? 
So one of the things that I was finding, um, I'm the, one of the creators of the Demystifying Diversity podcast, and we had a lot of people write in, in the midst of season one. And uh, a lot of people said things like, thank you for sharing parts of my story, right? Like, and these were not people that I interviewed. These were not people that were like on the record, but um, they were people that were seeing themselves reflected in the experiences of others. So for example, you know, we dealt with um, the spectrum of gender identity and human sexuality. We dealt with um, racial uh, sort of, you know, the, the space between the binaries and biracial identity, which is I'm, I'm biracial. Uh, we talked about, um, you know, uh, body liberation and fat acceptance and, you know, shaming of different body types. We talked about a lot of different things, but those are ones that come to mind when I'm thinking about people who reached out specifically and said, thank you so much for talking about this because I didn't, I wasn't hearing my story reflected and it was so important. And so that, you know, it allowed people to engage, I think, and to see themselves reflected in certain ways. Also, many of the people I interviewed, 128 people for season one of the podcast, um, which was such a gift, and it also informed the writing of the book. And um, every single person that I spoke with said, you know, thank you, thank you so much. And many of those people um, do tell their stories at high levels. You know, many of them have occupied stages and spoken openly about their experiences. And those were beautiful, enriching stories and experiences. But some of the interviews that most stand out to me are the ones of people who said, you know, I, nobody had ever asked me, you know, to tell my story before. No one ever wanted to hear. I didn't think I could talk about this. I didn't think anyone would want to listen. And um, and that, to me, just the, this acknowledgement of how much people crave being heard, being listened to, and listened to in a way, you know, as a journalist, and Pi, you're doing this right now, right? Like, you're asking questions, but it's really about my experience, my story, me sharing openly with you. It's not, you know, like call and response, which I think is how so much of conversation is. It's like one person says something and the other person's already premeditating what they're supposed to be saying. And, um, and so just to be heard, you know, I, I really, that's one of the things that I think diversity, equity, and inclusion has given me is an appreciation for how much people crave being known and heard and loved as they are and crave a sense of belonging. And I think those are the same things that people crave when they're coming out of trauma, coming out of abusive relationships, coming out of, you know, childhood experiences where they were told it's not okay to be you. And, you know, and like, we're all craving that feeling of like, oh yeah, I can be me and not just me as an individual, but me in community with others in a way where I make contributions to them, they make contributions to me, and we can move forward as a, as a collective. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. It's so like win-win, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so beautiful. Well, let's talk about binaries. Why are, why are binaries toxic? Yeah, oh, that's such, so in and of themselves, binaries there's nothing wrong with that but the challenge is when the binaries are the only thing that's offered and there's a belief that people have to fit into these binary categories and there's nothing in between mm -hmm. so i'll give a i'll give two concrete examples so one is i mentioned that i'm biracial i'm my dad was black my mom is white and so, you know, I exist in that spectrum between these, what in, at least in American society are considered these binary races, right? White and black. Well, if I exist in that space between, between, right? Like it is dishonoring to me personally, to my lived experience, to how I self-identify if I were forced to kind of pick a category, right? To pick a side. And so, um, but often people are placed in that position where they're made to say like, well, no, 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 you can't be two things at once. So what are you really like, you know, what, who are you really? Um, and same thing with gender, you know, we're seeing that, right. That there's often it's set up as, okay, well, you're either male or female. And really what we know is that there are a lot of people who identify somewhere in the spectrum between those extremes, same thing with, you know, human sexuality, right? Like there's something between, um, 
yeah, like between these binary categories of like either entirely same sex attraction or entirely different gender orientation, right? Like there's something in that in between space. And I think that the more we create room for people to be authentically wherever they are, whether that's in the binaries or somewhere in the spectrum between them, I think the the more healing it is for our sense of um, of who we are and the, the less it makes people feel like, oh, but I don't fit, right? Because like, that's a huge thing that like we, we struggle with wanting to belong. And so if you're told that, okay, well, either you can belong in this box or this box, and a person doesn't really see themselves completely in either, well, that can be very psychologically damaging um, to try to either force yourself to fit in or to feel like, okay, well, I'm not going to fit in. But then by virtue of not fitting in and going, it being like going counter to culture, um, then somehow I feel like I'm ostracized or like I don't fit, you know, and, and a lot of, I think when they're talking about the mental health impacts of racism and mental health impacts of, um, you know, being a member of certain marginalized communities or communities, um, members of the LGBTQ community, which I am also a member of that, I'm bisexual, um, you know, many members of the LGBTQ community who have experienced um, trauma of, of being discriminated against, like, th there are a lot of really negative psychological and social ramifications and internal consequences and cultural consequences. So I, yeah, so when I talk about the binaries being toxic, it's more like having binaries as the only option is really toxic. Um, so I'm not trying to negate those as choices or, or not even choices, but as, as markers of identity. But I think for some people it is, they are being forced to choose one or the other and their answer is neither or all or some combination, right? And so it's about, um, yeah, honoring people's experience and letting them tell you who they are as opposed to you telling them who you think they are. Yeah, yeah, that's so powerful. And I, 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 I think it's also, it makes sense to kind of, flip that around on yourself, like accept, accepting that you're like you internally don't fit exactly over here or over here, like accepting who you are in the middle and not letting other people tell you what box you need to put in, uh, put yourself into more of like a, a way to have self-acceptance and then also to like give that to other people. I'll give a somewhat, not an identity example from my own experience, but an experience example that I think deeply relates to um, trauma and, um, and this idea that, oh, it's either one thing or the other. And I've spoken about this before um, publicly, but not often. So I'm so glad to be able to kind of talk about it in this space because I think it could be helpful to your audience. Um, so I was sexually abused when I was five and I was sexually abused by a friend of the family who was like a father figure to me, who was deeply beloved to me and I cherished him in many, many ways. And also um, I experienced sexual abuse, right? And so many well-meaning people in my life as I got older and began to be more open about what happened said, you know, isn't he a horrible person? I can't believe he did that to you. You must hate him, right? And like, I was told, okay, well, you're supposed to hate him. And my experience was actually that like, I deeply, deeply love this person and I hated what was done to me. And some of it was, it was painful, but it was also kind of pleasurable. And, and like, it was really hard to reconcile all of that. Mm -hmm. And for me, a tremendous healing happened when I said, you know what? I loved this person and they did this thing that was really damaging to me. And I, you know, and it was hard that they did that. And I don't like that I still have consequences of that, but it also didn't mean that I stopped loving them the moment that that happened or that we didn't have good experiences together before or after. And, and so much of my shame and my internal confusion was sort of dissipated the moment that I said, you know what, I can hold multiple things at the same time. And I have found, because I do some consulting work with people and some coaching, and um, I have found that often when someone has been um, the victim of some sort of abuse or has survived some level of trauma, 
especially if it's from someone that you love or have a complicated relationship with, um, being able to kind of hold numerous feelings and even con seemingly conflicting feelings at the same time is an essential mm -hmm. part of that healing process. And so that's an example of how like, it's not always identity. Sometimes it's emotions sometimes it's experiences. Sometimes it's, you know, but, but yeah, like that, this need to kind of choose between things, I think really, um, it can be very, very harmful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, while, while you were telling that story, I was thinking, well, yeah, I mean, like I had a narcissistic mother and it's like, she's my mother. You know, it's like, there's still like, there's, there's so many conflicting feelings there, right? When, um, when you experience abuse from someone you love. Yeah. And even sometimes like the person can love you, but they can do a horrible thing. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Does it mean they didn't love me? You know, and all these, I think the human brain tries to figure things out and put it in boxes and categorize and sort. And the more, the more I do the work that I do and the more I love myself and other people, the more I realize the complexity of human identity and the complexity of human experience and that like good people do bad things, bad people do good things. Most of us are kind of a, a mixed bag of just like our own baggage and our own wants and desires and we're pulled and we're pushed and, and, and life gets really messy. And I think if, for me, holding that messiness has been just like, such a gift because it allows me to love my imperfect self and it allows me to show up vulnerably and to be honest about what's happening with me. And that's, you know, huge too in trauma recovery and being able to say like, yeah, this is what I'm feeling today and not eat that or stuff it or, you know, I don't know, drink the pain away or whatever, all the things that people do in order to kind of make themselves okay with the fact that they're not okay as opposed to just being able to say I'm not you know I'm not okay right now and share that with someone and and have some of that begin to dissipate in the process of being loved in a way that is actually nurturing and I also want to just say when I talk about sharing with someone like find someone safe you know to, to share with right yes. that can be that can be damaging to share with an unsafe person but like even just sharing with yourself even just beginning with journaling or um, you know, sort of conscious breathing or something, right? Like a, a, a form of kind of coming home to you and then finding someone in your sphere or a paid professional or coach or mentor or someone that is trustworthy that you can just say, you know what, I just, can you just listen to me? Like, can I just not be fixed, not be whatever, but can I just share authentically of myself with you? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. Um, can you tell us like what, what is othering people um, and why is it dangerous? Yeah. Ooh. Okay. So othering is a concept. It's a word that taught, that means like, you know, I'm trying to think of how to kind of like frame it in a way that's understandable, but um, so it, it basically holds that like, I am, you know, I'm one thing, I am one identity and you are other, you are different than I am, right? And so it can happen around race, it can happen around gender, it can happen around disabilities, it can happen around, um, you know, a lot of sort of the isms of society. So ableism, racism, uh, you know, xenophobia, the things that where basically it's like, well, this identity is somehow praised or lauded, and this identity is less than or or fundamentally different from and so it's um so it begins with that paradigm right when someone has that that thought process and then the othering itself is um is sort of like calling out that person's differences or um or pointing out the ways in which this sort of imaginary ladder of worth and societal ranking right like well i am better because i am this way and you are different because you are that way. Um, and so othering, I, I mean, I think othering in and of itself is a very traumatizing thing to be on the receiving end of because it feels like, oh my gosh, you know, you're telling me that I'm not as good. And that can be in a very aggressive and overt way mm -hmm. and even a violent way, or it can be in a very kind of microaggressive way where it's like, did that person just say, you know, did they just right. say that, you know? 
Um, and I want to say as well that othering, you know, most people point out that othering is very damaging to the person who is being othered, to the person who is being discriminated against. And it is, it is hugely problematic and painful and sad. And, and at the same time, the person doing the othering is also hurting themselves by doing that. Yeah. Um, because there is, there is this lack of acknowledgement of the shared nature of humanity, of empathy, of depth. And in fact, there's a huge level of sort of false perfectionism and idolatry that goes into that, that is very alienating. And when we look at things like, you know, the opioid crisis in America and the high rates of suicide, um, especially by, by gun and, you know, just different things where people, people are deeply, deeply traumatized who are doing the traumatizing of other people. And so I think that's an important point of reflection is that no one emerges from this stuff unscathed, right? So like if you're thinking that it's gonna make you feel better or I'm thinking that it's gonna make me feel superior to point out how I'm better than someone else will actually know the reverse is true. And so if I am pointing out what is different or wrong about you, like really it's essential for me to do the work to not see the world that way because it's it's healing to me it's 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 um restorative to me to be able to see whoever is in front of me as a fellow human being to be able to kind of like see their soul their goodness their um their resilience their culture their whatever you know the things that make them them and honor that and appreciate that and ask myself, like, what do I, what can I learn from this? How can I engage with this person? How can I be curious about them? How can I, how can I see myself reflected in them? Like, I mean, all of these things are things that bring us, bring the person doing that engaging a high level of healing and also are healing to the person who has maybe felt othered or excluded and is now being invited in to the space being invited into the conversation like it, it, I mean I believe that we're all connected and that we all are you know engaged in the symbiotic um, experience of life and so if I'm hurting someone else or or separating myself from someone else in a way that is cruel or violent or harsh you know I'm really I'm hurting myself, I'm hurting them, I'm hurting, you know, like it's, it, there's just nobody win. You talked earlier about win-win and I think othering is a lose-lose, right? Everybody, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Darylise, can you speak about humanization versus dehumanization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so dehumanization, I'll start with that first, would be um, essentially failing to recognize the, humanity of another segment of the population or, um, you know, and I think this tends to center around issues of demographics. So like race, gender, religion, um, those kinds of identity markers that people will dehumanize other groups of people or other individuals. And what it looks like is what's happening sadly in America right now with police brutality against um, people of color, um, it's happening with, um, you know, Islamophobia against Muslim Americans, it's happening with um, the, the horrible, the rampant anti-Semitism that's happening on college campuses with the violence against Asians in America. Um, I mean, it's, it's really, it's prevalent. Like we're seeing as slavery was an extreme example of dehumanization from one subset of society um, against another based purely on skin color and these imaginary um, sort of codifications of who ranks and who does not. And it was, it was brutal and is brutal. And the lingering impacts of that are, are just, seen, you know, on a daily basis in America and elsewhere, you know, I can mostly speak to the experience in this country, because that's where I was born and raised. And that tends to be most of the people that I interview. But, you know, I interviewed someone earlier today who was speaking about uh, his experiences of apartheid in Africa, right. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, dehumanization is, is devastating. And it has serious, 
consequences and and we miss out on the beauty of other people when you know when people dehumanize and it makes it makes victims of some people and it makes victimizers of others and 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 you know again for all the reasons that we talked about earlier um it's equally dehumanizing actually to the person who is doing the dehumanizing i mean the the pain suffered might be different and the and the level of agency might be different but it is it is excruciating it, the, the oppressor is dehumanizing themselves even as they are dehumanizing someone else and so that's de what dehumanization looks like that's sort of how to conceptualize it and humanization is the exact opposite of that right so it's this recognition that i am a person you are a person we each have value you know every person in that comprises the various social collectives of which we are a part has value has something to offer has um a beauty and a dynamism and a soul and a spirit that is uniquely their own and yet also not fundamentally different from mine or yours or the next person um and so humanization is really about about that it's about seeing the value in each and every fellow human being respecting their agency and autonomy and decision making respecting that they know themselves you know wanting to engage wanting to learn more about our fellow people appreciating the resilience of human beings and having empathy i mean i think empathy is the way to humanization is when we can really you know look at someone else and say you know tell me who you are you know tell me about yourself and and um and i think that's something that we can turn that skill in on ourselves and i mean i I'm, many of the members of your viewing audience may have done some mirror work or something but like looking at yourself in your own eyes um or writing in a journal or however we engage right and going to therapy all of the things just a way to kind of like look at ourselves and say okay, you know, I might not feel good enough. I might not feel smart enough. I might, might not feel pretty enough. I might not feel, you know, I might feel so damaged based on my past, but I'm going to acknowledge that I have some value and worth, and I'm going to spend the time seeing that value and worth and honoring it and getting to know myself better. I mean, I think it's something we can do with us um, and we can do with others. And, and it's sort of a like it sort of feeds on itself, right? Like the more that I acknowledge the beauty of other human beings, the more I'm forced to recognize my own beauty as well. And the more I acknowledge my own beauty and goodness and let go of some of the barriers that are keeping me stuck, the more I kind of have an open heart space to be able to connect with others. So I think, I think it's a mix of doing this work on ourselves and also being engaged in the world in a way where we can see the humanity in other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Mm. And you have a free gift for our viewers. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, I do. So I wrote a book called Demystifying Diversity, Embracing Our Shared Humanity. And uh, the book is based on the 128 interviews that I conducted um, over the span of about a year. And takeaways from from that some learnings about like how to stand up for ourselves and others how to embrace who we are at a core level how to make a commitment to um, engaging in meaningful ways with people and from cultures their backgrounds that are different than our own and really just like kind of falling in love with ourselves and others and so there's a book and a workbook that um, you can buy separately and um and so yeah what we what i did as a the free giveaway is gave people um the preface and the first chapter um along with the workbook preface and the first workbook chapter so that they can just begin to engage just begin to engage it's totally free no obligation to buy the book um but i think there's some beautiful lessons about um about healing and moving through the pain of the past and finding a sense of belonging and finding a sense of purpose and a you know just like learning to learning to love because trauma really that's one of the things that I have found in diversity equity and inclusion work is that I have learned to love myself and others and you know if you're a person that has been especially I know a lot of the people 
um, participating have been on the receiving end of childhood <laughs> abuse or narcissism, right? And so that 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 wounds that it makes it hard to, to trust others with our hearts. It makes us hard to to love ourselves or feel lovable. And so I think a, a lot of the work that I do, even though I'm operating from the lens of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, and people might be like, yeah, but what does that have to do with trauma? Like it has everything to do with it. It's it's a, an experience of falling in love with your own humanity and the, the humanity of others. Yeah. Oh, so beautiful and such a big, beautiful vision. Oh, thank you, Daryl so much. You're, I, I appreciate your your expertise and you sharing yourself so vulnerably and bravely and, um, and this beautiful free gift that you're offering our viewers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pai. And thank you to everyone who took the time to watch and listen and engage. And I hope something that I said was helpful uh, because I, yeah, I deep, I, we may not have met, but I deeply, deeply care about you. Yeah. Oh, me too. That's why I do this series. <laughs> so yes, thank you everybody who's watching and who's joined us today for Trusting After Trauma Season 3. We're going to continue to explore with our experts on how we can transition to transformation after narcissistic abuse and heal our body, mind, and spirit to live joyful, authentic lives. We'll see you soon.